turn in your Bibles, if you will, to, well, let's see, where shall we start? Um, how about Romans chapter 4? And um, I want to talk to you about the issue of believing. Th there, there is a great, great, large constituency of Christian people that call themselves Christian people who say that some people are predestinated to heaven and predestinated to hell. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but they'll talk about that predestination. Everybody talks about predestination because they don't understand what it means and they want to know about it. And it's not that they haven't heard about it, it's just that they can't believe God's doing what they say. And when you think about it just a little bit, you realize that if, if God predestinated a certain group of people to be saved, and he predestinated a certain group of people that would naturally not be saved by doing that, then obviously there are some people that cannot get saved. I don't believe that, and the Bible doesn't teach it. Uh, that teaching began long before, uh, most people think it started in the Middle Ages, but it did start earlier than that. It, it is a doctrine that goes way, way back beyond uh, even the beginning of Christianity, but but the people who really made it, uh, the first time I ever heard somebody tell me about pagans that believed it was, he told me about, he did uh, studies in the Middle East after World War II. He spent two years traveling around uh, for the US military and he did studies, uh, cultural studies about the religions of the Middle East because the Middle East got carved up after World War II. If you know, uh, Iraq didn't even exist until after World War I and then World War II, it changed borders again. And they've changed all these, they just redraw the map, however. And uh, so he did some studies on that. And he was telling me about the law doctrine of lost souls. And, and those lost souls in the Muslim religion are people who cannot get saved. So there are people in their mind that live in this world that are just props. They're window dressing. Uh, they're like, uh, it was explained to me that they're like sharks coming through the ocean. And you're swimming and they're trying to deter you from getting to your destination. And, uh, and stop you from doing your job, so to speak. And so they said, he was talking about this, how they explained it to him. And uh, this was kind of interesting to me because uh, that concept of not being able to get saved or not being able to reach God uh, for some unknown reason that you're not even responsible for is a very strange concept. It kind of makes everything over before it ever gets started, doesn't it? And uh, we were talking about this the other day, and I was trying to explain this to Scott a little bit, and we were having a discussion about it. And I, one of the things I mentioned was that it's unjust. And the question is, who is it unjust toward? You know, you kind of think that, well, I if you're saying it's unjust, it means it's unjust for all those people who have to go to hell without even a chance. Well, that it is. But it's also unjust towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if that's the case, and there are a predetermined group of people that are going to go to heaven and a predetermined people that are naturally going to go to hell because they weren't elected to go to heaven, then what happens? Then the Lord Jesus Christ ends up dying only for the ones who went to heaven. That's what they say. In reality, he died for all men, and this is where the rub comes. So the Presbyterians, they say that, okay, you don't really have a free will. Okay, so now we start getting, now it gets really strange because if you don't have a free will, you say, why did he say, don't eat of the tree, if they couldn't make that decision? If you look at it sensibly and just honestly, you're going to find out that these things are all created with very dark and sinister motives. The idea of you not having to believe because you think, because somebody has persuaded you, that you're already part of God's program, and for what reason you don't really know, but it might be because you've been, become a Presbyterian or a Reformed, whatever. And, and they, they all preach this about you don't have a free will. They say it in their doctrinal statements. Uh, they, they make a joke about uh, people who believe in the free will, and they say that when you get saved that God tickles your willer. And that was their little joke about, you know, you have a willer and God will tickle it, and then you'll get saved, and that sort of thing. And they make fun of people who have a free will. And so when you look at how unjust it is towards his son, uh, all the rest of it seems kind of pale. For him to die for all those people that, will, that could never be saved is an injustice to him. 
okay? And, and it really is exactly the opposite of that. He died for all men. And when you see that he died for all men, turn back to Romans 3, he died for all men, and he did so so that all men could be saved. And if you look at Romans chapter 3, go over there first, he says, but now, verse 21, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto, notice, he says, unto all, and what? Upon all them that believe. Well, there is no difference. So what does the unto all mean? That means it's unto all people. It's unto everybody. It's unto all mankind. Now, upon all has to do with those of mankind that actually believe in their heart that Christ died for their sins, and they don't trust anything else. And so what happens is you have a statement here by the Apostle Paul in verse 22 that completely destroys both Arminianism and Calvinism, okay? Arminians say that you, you can believe, but you can lose it, and you've got to do it again. They're on the treadmill program where you've got to keep doing it over and over and over. Well, when you keep doing something over and over and over, what you're really saying about the cross of Christ is that it's not effective and that what Jesus Christ did in verse 22 of believing God and understanding God and in his own heart being God did what he agreed to do with his Father and the Holy Spirit. And so his faith was able to make him do this. And you say, well, why would God have to have faith? Well, why wouldn't God have faith? Is it impossible for God to have faith? Who would he have faith in? Well, if you live in a family of three, you'd have faith in the other two, wouldn't you? And wouldn't you have faith in yourself to do that? In the Garden of Gethsemane, did he not change his mind when he says, let this cup pass from me? And, and not go through this process of dying and, and having the entire wrath of God come upon himself about this whole concept of, of paying for the sins of the whole world. That's a pretty daunting thing to have to, to, to face for any man, much less a man who knew who his father was. Okay, Many people today don't know who their fathers are and don't care. Well, he did. And so his faith was to keep the promise that he made before the foundation of the world. Now, this whole thing is about his faith and his faith first. It is, as it says in verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all. It is not by faith in Jesus Christ. That comes over here in the next part of chapter 3. But it is, if you'll notice in verse 26, it's which uh, he says, he is the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean you've got to believe that Jesus lived and Jesus died and Jesus rose again. Only you need to believe who he was. And there's a lot of details about that. And he is right in the middle of giving you all those details right here in chapter 3. So the, the, the problem is that God's desire is that all men be saved. And he says so in 1 Timothy 2. So if it's his will and desire that all men be saved, why won't they all be saved? Because they have a free will, and they will not believe, some of them. And so while some will, some will not. And so that's the way it is. And, and he, it is his will that all men be saved. He's not willing that any man should perish. He's not willing that these people who have uh, even confronted him and rejected him and denied him. Peter denied him three times, did he not? Yes. And the Lord says about all the lost people that deny him, that they deny the Lord that bought them. So did he buy them even though they would not benefit from it? They, they did. They, they denied him. And even though they did understand that he came in the flesh, some of them talked to him, some of them uh, railed on him when he was hanging on the cross, some of them were very upset with him. Uh, they had a midnight trial, a very big planned event with his death. And by the way, they tried to do that for three and a half years while he was preaching. So when you see the whole thing work itself out, you see that there's some confusion in this area. And Paul wants you to know about your election. Okay? And your election has to do with the job that you're supposed to do. That's what it's about. If you elect a guy to Congress and you send him up there, shouldn't you expect him to do his job? 
what happens today? We send them up there and they don't do anything, okay, except try to hang on to some power and then try to suck us, you know, dry from all, for all we got. So what happens in the election really it's, it's a really good election, is a very, very good example when you have a political election of what God is doing with election because when God elects people to do something, he expects them to do it. Has he elected you? He has. But what has he elected you to do? Well, you have to learn it. Turn over to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter Now, let's see here. Paul talks about the election, the issue of election. And this election is, and we're not going to have time to go into all of the parts of this today, but I do want to talk to you about this. Uh, in uh, let's see where did I say that was here uh, uh, First Thessalonians 1 4 is where I want to go where is it at there there it is okay I'm sorry uh, notice what he says in verse 3 1 Thessalonians 1 3 remembering without ceasing and he's talking to them about their labor he says your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope now, that, those three things there are, uh, that verse identifies true spiritual maturity, okay? When, you're, when, you, when you, the work that you have, you do by faith, you live your life by faith, you have a labor that you love, you don't complain and moan about it, you love it, you do it for him, and you're patiently waiting and doing it until he comes back, okay? Now, that's maturity. And uh, when, you, when you look into verse 4, he just makes this little statement. He says, knowing, brethren, and the reason that you can do this is because you now knowing something will help you do what he's telling you that you should be doing in verse 3. He's remembering they're already doing it. He's remembering the, the, the life of the Thessalonians. That's why in verse 2 he says, we give thanks to God always for you uh, all, making mention of you in our prayers. He says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. So the Thessalonians were a model group, and what he's doing here is he's saying, there's a way for you to stay on track with this maturity of this work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope, if you'll just remember this, knowing this. He says, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. And then he doesn't explain any of it. Why? Because he is just reminding them that he knows that they understand this, okay? So if you don't understand election, what can that do for you? It can cause you to not remember what your job is. It can cause you to not be spiritually mature. Because you need a foundation that gets you from one place to the other. And when you're elected, what happens? In January, when the guy gets elected in November, he's got to wait through the rest of November and all of December, and the middle of January, they install him into the White House. And man, he's looking to go to that White House, and he's already working on all the things. The election's over, he's already working on what he's gonna do, and they're gonna hit the ground running, you know, that sort of thing. In the first 100 days, I'm gonna do this. How about just giving us a clear testimony? Could you tell us when you got saved? You know, that, they can't even do that. And so their election is just something that people do. But this is far greater than what people do. This has to do with God. So I want to explain something to you about this. Election, for you to understand election, you have to know a little bit about it and, and really study it a little bit. But to give you an entity issue on this, to show you the entity issue is the election is not something that God does for each individual person. He does not elect you to go do anything, okay? And I just said a while ago that you, you have an election, it's your election. But it's an election because you're in Jesus Christ and he is the elect of God. And he's the only person that's the elect of God. There are no other persons individually that are elect by God himself, the Father, except the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you get put into Jesus Christ, when you get put into the body of Christ, guess what? 
you're in him, okay? And when you're in him, that makes you one of the elect. If you buy stock in Apple, are you a stockholder? Yes. All you have to do to be a stockholder is buy the stock. Can you help run the company? No. If you buy enough of it and get on the board, then you can do that. If you buy enough of it again, you can take the company over, okay? But you can't do that with God. So God puts, God puts Jesus in this position where he is the elect of God. He is the only person in the Godhead that is going to carry out his will to create heaven and earth and fulfill his will concerning it. That's a big job. So how do you get in? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ is the beloved. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. We'll talk more about this a little later, but I just want you to know that the Lord Jesus Christ is his beloved son. He says so. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He says it both ways. And, and he is the beloved. He is the one who is beloved of the Father, and he has been elected to do many different things. One of the things he's elected to do is to die and make the payment. The other thing he's elected to do is to be the head of the church, the body of Christ. The other thing he's elected to do is be the king of Israel and the Messiah and so forth. All of that's part of his election. He is going to take the earth back unto himself. And when he does that, he is now going to have, he has heaven now under his control. Satan and his group is still hanging out because they're, being, they're allowed to. There's no place for him to go except hell and the earth, and they're not ready for the earth yet. So what's going to happen is when he kicks them into the earth, they're on the last step before hell. And the, then the heavens will be purged, and we will be brought up into the heavenly places, and we'll be installed in our place according to our election. And you're going to have a job according to that election, and that's when you get to go to the White House and start your ministry. Okay? Of course, it won't be a White House. It's going to be something different. But I can tell you that th there are things waiting for you out there that you, as the small, wormy little person you are, I'm not demeaning you individually, but I'm saying you're a very fragile creature. Okay, and you're of limited intellect, okay, <laughs> according to God's word. And you also have some other issues like sin, okay. And oh, by the way, your body's wearing out, okay. So uh, when you start looking at all that, you go, how am I going to do all this? Well, uh, about two seconds after he installs you into a new body, you're going to know exactly what's going to happen, okay. And you're going to be absolutely eternal and totally free to do all that God has commanded you to do. And you will do it willingly. Ephesians chapter 2 or 1 says this, verse 5, having predestinated us. Now, if he's predetermining where we go, how can you say that he doesn't do that? Well, he does it because he has predestinated something according to his election. What has he predestinated? He's predestinated a way for you to get saved. He's predestinated a, a body for you to live in, the body of Christ. That's a new family. The, the church, the body of Christ, is a family of people in which he is the head of. Now, he's talking about predestination, and when he says the word us, he means corporately, all of us, body of Christ. Us means more than one, right? So, there it is. He says, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Not begrudgingly, not because he had to do it. He did it by the good pleasure of his will will to the praise of the glory of his grace he did it and he says wherein he hath made us what accepted in the beloved so because we're in the body of christ and we're in jesus christ who is the beloved of god we are now accepted in christ it, we're not accepted outside of him you have absolutely no excuse okay Romans chapter 2, verse 1 says, Thou art inexcusable, O man. So if you're inexcusable and now you've been excused, what has happened? Something's happened. There's a transition. There's a transaction. And that transaction is that you have, by faith, been put into the body of Christ. And when you get put into the body of Christ, you're in Christ and you're made a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 Paul says that we're made the righteousness of God in him. So when do you get God's righteousness? When he puts you into Christ. Where does it come from? It's in his son. You see, he looks at you the same way he looks at his son. Now that's comforting to me. 
And so I want to tell you today that no matter what you're listening to this today, I want to tell you this, that you can believe the Bible about all of these things. And if you'll learn properly what election is, you'll not be thinking that you're in some special club that God has formed in order to just make you the favorite. If he tells us not to do anything by partiality, then he should not do anything by partiality. And he does not. He says himself, he's no respecter of persons. And while he was seemingly a respecter of persons with Israel when they were the favored nation, it's because he elected them to do that. Now that's the second group of the elect, the nation of Israel. They are elected to accomplish his goal. And if you'll notice, their roadmap is up here on the board right here. This is the entire plan for the election of God's chosen nation, you see. And there it is. And they're supposed to do exactly what he wanted them to do. Did they do it? What, what did they have here? What happened here? That was their fail right here. But did that have to happen? Yes. Matter of fact, he actually enlisted 12 men to do this. And one of them, he says, is a devil. And that devil was the one who played the key part in getting it all done. Without, without the, the help of Judas Iscariot, there would have been a problem in this whole thing. You see, th there you begin to see, well, okay, so now Judas, said he can't go because he was in the plan. No, he had a chance to not do it. Okay, Everybody God deals with has a choice. And they don't have to make the wrong choice. Did Lucifer make the choice to be Satan? He certainly did. So what happens? God makes people, preachers, angels, all these things with a free will, and it's their choice to do as they will. And when it goes outside the scope of God's plan and program, and they decide that they will not do what God wants them to do, well, that becomes sin. And when it becomes sin, then you can't stand in my presence. So where are you going to go? You've got to get cast out. And the Lord said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. He said it over in Genesis. I saw Satan fall like lightning out of heaven. You know, he fell out because they had a falling out. <laughs> and God tricked the devil. And now the devil's trying to trick us. And who did he trick him to? Judas Iscariot. And he went through and he, he participated in the cross. And because of that, things worked out. Do you notice that God in Ephesians chapter 1 says that he is going to work all things out. Look at verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated, we, the body of Christ, according to the purpose of him who worketh all things, what? After the counsel of his own will. So remember what I said, if you use the two phrases, override and overrule. Do you remember what the difference was? I guess there's just one R there. Overrule. Override means that he comes inside of you and makes it so you can't do what you're supposed to do. He takes away your free will. He doesn't do that. He lets you make the decision, and instead of overriding your thinking process, what does he do? He will overrule you. How do you get overruled? Well, have you ever been in the courtroom and they say overrule? The judge will say, go ahead, speak your piece. And then somebody else wants to say something. They object to it. And he says, overruled. <laughs> he just, he has the authority. So when God overrules, what does he do? That means that he rules, which is what God does, because God rules, right? And he rules over his creatures. If you're making a, taking a lump of clay and making a bowl out of it, can you imagine the bowl actually speaking back to you and saying, I want to be a teacup, and you say, no, shut up, you're going to be a bowl. Do you think that would ever happen to you if you were making pottery? I don't think, my daughter's made lots of pottery. I don't think it's ever once happened to her. And so as you think about how ridiculous that is, you think about how ridiculous the creature is in relation to the creator and the, and the vast distance there is between them until Calvary. And Calvary takes the creature in one hand and God in the other, and he stands there with him, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he brings us back to God because he, knowing how to do all this, 
overrules in all the affairs of men, and he brings about things that happen so that they happen according to his free will. And God's free will works just like ours, only he never makes bad decisions. And he overrides? No, he overrules. And when he overrules, what happens? Things begin to change, and they stay on course. Now, people say, well, no, he overrides because he comes and he makes it so you can't believe. He's never done that. What is the supreme example of the fact that God will never override a human person's free will? There would never be such a place as that in hell. And he would never allow people to go there if there was a way, okay, out of it. He has to do what he does because he's just and holy. And so the fact that he says, well, you know, I've given you a free will and I've decreed it to be so. And if you choose to go there, that's where you'll go. If you choose not to believe what I say in my word, then you're not going to come and live with me. You're going to go down there and live with him. I tell that to the kids at the camp. If you believe in the devil, you spend eternity with him. And if you believe in God, you spend eternity with him. And, it, and it's, a simplif it's a simplified thing, but at the same time, the fact that he will let a person die and go to hell of his own free will proves that he will not intervene and override his thinking. People say that Pharaoh in Romans chapter 9 had to be he had to be messed with internally, that he, God hardened his heart, meaning that he can't make the decision. Hardening your heart comes when you give the word of God to somebody and they reject it, and they use their free will to reject it. So it's not, I can't make a decision anymore. It's that I have made my decision. And by the way, when you watch Pharaoh's thinking, he won't let him go. He won't let him go. And then after the frogs and after the bloody water and after all the other stuff, he goes, okay, let him go. And then what does he do? They get out and they leave. And then what does he do? He chases him down. He says, no, I'm not going to let him go. So first he says, no, I'm not going to let him go. Then I say, okay, let him go. Now I'm not going to let him go. You know, he, he made three decisions about this. And the reason that he went after them and lost his entire army in the sea is that because he was prideful, and he was a proud man, and he did not want to let them go. He had an issue with Moses. He had an issue with God. And finally, he, now he's got an issue with hell. And, and so there is a decision here. Okay? The Bible says that it, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the way in thereof, is the, they're the ways of death. People think that they're going to get to God many, many different ways. And God help you if you start preaching that that's not true. Because if you start saying that, well, okay, you talk to a Muslim man about this, he'll, he'll tell you, no way, there's only one way. If you talk to a Catholic man about this, he'll say, no, 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 there's one way, the church, the Catholic church, that's it. The Greek Orthodox, they'll say the same thing. And so all of a sudden you say, well, all the big world religions, they all say that you can only go their way. Christianity is no different. But when you get to Christianity, there's a whole bunch of people that want to kind of act like uh, they want to be politically correct and say, well, there's a lot of doors to get to God, and, you know, you can go through a lot of different doors, and there's so many doors, and these doors, and just let me share with you what these doors can do. And if you just go through that door, you'll get there. You'll just get there a different way. No, you're going to drop off into hell when you go through the wrong door. Gene Raver used to say, door number one, door number two, door number three. And when that door used to open, everybody in America would go, is it the big prize? And they open it up and it goes, meh, you lost it all. <laughs> You're going to hell, you know. We were over at Disney Quest one time and we went in this virtual reality thing. And uh, it was based on the movie Hercules. And in the movie Hercules, in the movie... Uh, you go into this thing and you're, you're, you're on this, uh, you got this 3D thing on and you're, you're in this room and it's, it's all virtual reality. It's really cool. But what they did is they made it, they patterned it after the movie Hercules and this scene that you were going to be in was in the River Styx in the netherworld. And when I went on this, I couldn't believe that they were showing this to the general public. I had never even seen the movie. So I go through this thing and we're floating through this lava in hell. <laughs> There's all these creatures and all this weird stuff. 
And, and, and so that thing lasted for a very short period of time, and they said, that was a bad idea. Okay, we didn't think we need to do that. And so as a result, they took it out and put Pirates of the Caribbean in. Okay, everybody liked that. So now you can go you know, shoot pirate ships and all that in there. But, but that whole thing about being in hell was scaring the little ones. It was scaring the parents. Why? Because they're all walking around Disney not knowing where they're going. You don't need a map to get to hell, okay? You just need to, to kind of believe something that somebody else has said that isn't true. So Satan's goal in all of this is to get you to believe simply that because you're one of his elect of God that you really don't need to believe. In reality, it's not important that you believe because God is actually going to do that for you. Now what's the net result of that? You don't believe. And what happens if you don't believe? Didn't we just read it? It's unto all and upon them that believe. So do you have to believe? Yeah. So you should know what you should believe. Okay. And if you know what you believe, then you'll know whether you're saved or not. By the way, you can do that. All right. It's possible that you believe God's word. And it only takes once to be saved. You don't have to believe it 4,700 times and every week and all that. You get saved one time. And some people teach you can't believe. Some people believe that you can believe, but you got to work. Uh, some people believe that believing is a work. Okay, turn over to Romans 4 and you'll see that. And Paul makes it clear that that's not true, that believing is never a work. It can never be a work. Believing is not possible if you think it's a work, because if you're working, then you can't, you're not believing. Okay, Romans 4 says this. For what saith the scripture? Verse 3. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. What? What do you think it is in that verse? Abraham believed God, and it. Okay, so what's the it in the verse? I mean, Abraham was a, he was a cool guy. I mean, he was a young guy at one time in his life. We, we, he comes on the scene, he's 75, okay? But even back then, 75 for him was young because he lived to be quite an old man, okay? So at 75, he was still riding around on a horse commanding an army of men. So that's not done very much today. Abraham was a <coughs> strong guy, okay? And he did a lot of great things. I mean, he went down and he rescued Lot when he needed rescuing. And he charged God himself, the, the angelic <coughs> presentation there that he has with God when the three angels come and talk to him, he says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Are you going to go down there and kill all those people? I mean, I've got family down there. That's where Lot went. And he's down there and his <coughs> wife and his uh, two girls. And we don't know how many others were down there that were saved. According to the Bible, they're the only ones that came out. So evidently, they were the only four there. So you see why Abraham's concerned? He says, if there's 50 righteous, will you spare it? But is there 40 righteous, 30 righteous, 20 right? He goes all the way down. And at the end, he says, yes. Okay, if there are any righteous in there, I won't destroy it. Okay? Were there 10 righteous in there? No. Four of them got out. One of them wasn't righteous. Okay, out of the four. The other two didn't act righteous. Okay? And the only guy left was Lot, okay? So we know he was righteous, and he was Abraham's nephew, and he understood what believing was. That's the whole, that's the whole progress of, of everything he was doing, was trying to get people to believe what God was telling him. He says, what shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? Well, he's found the same thing you found, okay? That you're not going to be able to get to God through works. He says, for if Abraham were justified by works... He hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So if he were justified by works, meaning that he was showing himself to be a just man, that's a good thing, but that won't save you. You see, he says, not before God. You see that? Turn back to chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 19. Notice the contrast and the and the comparison here in the similarity he says now we know that what things soever the law saith it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty who before who God 
he says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified, notice, in his sight. In his sight and before God is when God is being the judge of you individually. But if people want to see if you're doing good, what do you have to do? you got to be doing good for them to see it. What does it say in James chapter 2? It says, ye see then, okay? So if ye see then a man's works, then you could understand he had faith. That's one way, because a Jew requires a sign. And so if a Jew looks at a man, he's doing good works, that's an obvious indication that maybe he's saved. Does it mean he's saved? No, it just is an indication. Ye see then. But see, they don't walk by faith. They walk by sight. They require a sign. They're the, the original show me state, just like Missouri, only they're the show me nation. And so as you see it, you see that God's program today has to do with you understanding what believing is, and you do that. Notice what he says in Romans 4 again. He says, now to him that worketh is the reward, verse 4, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So if you're going to work to get into the elected group, then you're not going to get it by grace because grace and works don't mix this way. He says, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace. So how do you get in when it's not reckoned of grace? You don't, okay? You make God the debtor. You say, well, I did it. You need to, oh, you need to pay up. You need to give me what I need. Well, no, that's not the case. He's not going to give you what you need. He's going to give you what you deserve right over here. Okay, you don't need that, all right? But you will get it if you try to make God a debtor and try to do something and then make him pay you with eternal life because that won't work, all right? So this idea here in verse 5 makes the contrast. He says, but he says to him that worketh not. So when you come to the point of believing what are you really doing? You're agreeing with God, you're believing the word of God, yes. But he says, but to him that worketh not, but believeth. Have you come to the point where it's time to cease the working nonsense? Have you come to the point where you realize that maybe it's just not working? <laughs> My working isn't working? And are you understanding that when you work, you deny the whole idea and the concept of faith? You're, you're proving. People say, well, they're Catholic, but I think they're good Catholics. Well, there is no such thing, okay? What you're saying is they're a Orthodox Catholic, that, or, or they're, they're really stiff, you know. Mel Gibson's one of these. He, he only listens to the Latin. Only the Latin. <laughs> and he doesn't know any Latin, okay? But he likes the old school stuff. He's kind of like the, the guys who hung out in Spain during the Inquisition, and they were very spiritual with all their torture chambers and spies and people that killed people. All their, you know, they did it. And they're not the only religion. Islam's doing it today, okay, on TV, okay? So they don't think there's anything wrong with it. They believe those people aren't going to go to hell. They're going to go or go to heaven. They're going to go to hell. And so when they strap themselves up with all the explosionary stuff and they're going to go into the airport and blow everybody to smithereens, they believe that they're going to be instantly in God's presence. Surprise, 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 okay? It's not going to be a lot. It's going to be this right here. They're going to blow themselves there of their own accord, their own decision, because somebody has taught them that just because they're raised in a particular family and have been doing all these things just right, and they're going to sacrifice their life for Allah, that Allah will reward them. And I'm going to tell you that they're so misguided and, and they, they misunderstand so much about who God really is that, well, it's very difficult for them to stop working. The ceasing of works is very important, but to him that worketh not. He's not talking about in your religious life. He's talking about quit working to get saved. He says, notice the contrast, but to him that worketh not, but what? Believeth on him, you see, that justifies the ungodly. Jesus Christ will justify any ungodly man, woman, or child who will believe the gospel of grace. Right there. And he says his faith is counted for righteousness. 
If you'll notice up here, he says, if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it. Now, if you want to know what it is, it's the same thing down here in verse 5 when it says his faith, the person who's believing, it's the same thing up there for Abraham. It's his faith. His faith was counted to him for righteousness. Now, when did Abraham get circumcised? In chapter 17 of Genesis. When did he believe? Chapter 12 or somewhere near there, okay? Genesis 15, we have it recorded, but, but Genesis 12 is when he began the conversation with God. So somewhere between 12 and 15, he gets saved. But it's a long period of time goes by between there and chapter 17 when he says, take the knife and I want you to perform surgery on yourself. Okay. Why? <laughs> okay. You, you think he got all excited about that? As a male, I think no. I think not. I think he did have to have it explained to him. If you go down here, he says that circumcision is a sign. If you'll notice, verse 11, and he received the sign of circumcision. So maybe it wasn't self-inflicted, but maybe he, you know, somebody else helped him with that. He says, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had. Oh, before he had it done, what was he? He was being, he says, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised. So was he saved and justified before God before he got circumcised? Great. So what should you do between faith and works? If you have faith over here and you have works over here, shouldn't you put some space between those to try to, when you're trying to explain the doctrine so that you don't mix this one up with this one over here? That's a, that's a very, very interesting principle laid out that God waits that period of time before he has him do one religious thing, and it's a sign. Why do you do that? Because the Jews require a sign, and that's the first one. See, I'm a Jew. Prove it. I'm a Jew. Prove it. I sell clothing. That's not proof. Okay, what do you want for proof? Drop your drawers, okay? And he looks at it and he goes, okay, because no self-respecting Gentile would do that to himself because he didn't want to be identified with Israel and a Jew. You see, it's a sign. And, and unless, he's a, unless he's a circumcised proselyte that has become a Jew, then he's a Gentile. So there was a way that that could be determined, okay? And that was a sign. He says here, it is a sign, okay? It's a sign. Now, we get into this, okay, through this process, but we don't go through this process of circumcision. He says, verse 11, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised. Now notice why. He says, Here's why it worked out this way, that he might be the father of all them that, what? Believe. He doesn't say the father of all them that are circumcised. He says the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised. So Abraham back here in Genesis 15, 6, is your faith father example of how to believe God and get justified by faith. And by the way, in, in James chapter 2, where people always run to try to disprove this, James proves it beautifully. He says it beautifully, and he proves it beautifully. And he makes the contrast between works to get saved and works to uh, demonstrate in your life, and he shows that when it comes to getting saved, it is faith alone without works. Chapter 1, verse 18, he says that before you ever get into chapter 2. And so when you look at it, you say, well, isn't he saying that faith without works is dead? Well, if you're saved and you've believed God and you've had faith and you're now in the body of Christ and you refuse to do the good works that you're foreordained to do, are you not living in a dead zone where you're not doing anything the way you should? You say, well, I'm not doing anything. I'm saved, satisfied, and sitting, and I'm just sitting, and I'm not doing anything. Well, what do you do? Some people require to see it. Like, you know, they say, well, I want to see it. 
Well, maybe some people are doing things that you don't see. Do you get any credit for that? Well, before God, you do. But when it comes to believing in the heart, who's that before? That's before God. That's not before men. And so if people, if you, if you say, well, why? We're not supposed to go out and show our works off. Well, no. But it doesn't mean that you're not supposed to do good works. Okay? We're to be rich in good works. We're to demonstrate good works. We're to walk in good works. But those good works, and if you don't believe it, just read the book of Titus, okay? The idea is that you're to walk by faith and do good works. But why? Not to get saved, but because you're already saved. And the natural consequence of being saved is that you want to do good works. I think it's a wonderful thing. Faith that actually works in your life is functioning faith. It's not dead. It's fully alive. You're alive in Christ, and you're living it. And so now we see how the way was paved, and he says here that he, he would be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised. Why? That righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Do you know who the them is? That's you and me. And anybody else that's ever gotten to God by faith outside the nation of Israel. He is called and he is in verse 12, and the father of circumcision to them who are of the circumcision only. You're not part of that. He says, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. Do you understand that, that now we're saved today the same way Abraham was saved? Do you know that the law of Moses or the law of God given to Moses was actually built on that premise? And that the law was a curse to them. It has nothing to do with what we're supposed to be doing today. And so when people get all confused about election and predestination and all these things. It's because they don't understand the basic concept of how to believe God's word. Believing God's word is so simple that anybody can do it. And you don't have to study the doctrine of Calvinism to learn it. You can believe some people teach believing is a work. It's not. It says so right there in Romans 4. And some teach that you have to have faith and works to get saved. That's not true. He justifies the ungodly, not the people who think they're godly because they've been doing things. If you go over in verse 8 of chapter 5, he says, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay? So that's grace. That's the grace of God that brings salvation. And, and that's where it is. And if you were born under the law, what would happen? If you happened to be born under the law back there in Israel's program, what would happen? You'd need some grace. Because you'd be sinning and breaking the law all the time. And in some cases, you'd break laws that there were no sacrifices for. So then what do you do? Like King David, you get in trouble and you can't get out. Notice in verse 21. 521. He says, now, he says that as sin hath reigned unto death... And it's proven itself through that reign of death. Even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that's the future for you and I. But for those who were under the law, they had a terrible time living under that law. Because if you don't do this, you get whooped. And if you don't do this, you get whooped. And if you do that, you'll get the blessing. You'll live. You'll stay alive. I got to do that to stay alive? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what happens if I don't do it? You won't stay alive. You get, you, you get punished. And sometimes it was individual, and sometimes it was corporate. Sometimes it was so corporate that the ground opened up and a whole bunch of people fell down at one time. Just boom, there it is. You don't have to go to hell. It comes to you. There it is. And so God does these things because he had a contract with them. But under that time where they were under that contract, notice what he says. Verse 20, moreover, the law entered... Why? Chapter 3 already taught us that. He says that the offense might abound, okay? And so how did they live under that? He says, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So under the law program, what abounded more than the law? The grace of God. For every person that lived under that law had an opportunity to have an object lesson day in and day out in their life to teach them you're not making it. And if you're not making it, you're faking it. And if you're faking it, you're going to hell. So what do you need? 
What is it that you need? We need a Savior. That's what we need. And once you thought that in your heart and you understood that in your mind and you realized the law could not save you, what would you do? You would bring it, you would, you would take a holy look at the law. You would now come to the altar and you would come to the, into the program of Judaism and saying, you know, this is a picture of how we're going to be saved. This is a picture of redemption. This is a picture of the blood that's going to be shed for us. This is a picture of where we're headed. This is a picture of our future. This is the picture of God's plan to save us. And you would gladly do the things under the law by your own free will and your own heart. And when you messed up, and you would, well, the law was merciful and gracious to you. And it was very interesting in David's life because when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and then he murdered Uriah to cover it up, uh, all these other things uh, that he did, he, he was so afraid of dying and God just stepped in. He, he overruled his own law. Have you ever seen that in the New Testament? I have. It's, it's there with the Seraphonician woman. She says, I want a healing. He goes, I'm not sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. No. And then they have this conversation and she describes who she is and she calls him Lord, and she says, truth, Lord. But the children do get to eat the scraps that fall off the, the, the table. The dogs get to eat the scraps that fall off the children's table. And she took her place as a Gentile dog, wanting some scraps. And he says, you know your election. You know your identity. You understand who you are, and you understand who I am. And your daughter's sick. He says, okay, go home. She's fine. He just reached right out over the dispensation of grace. And he gave her what's going to give, be given over there, and he gave it out back here. Why? How can he do that? He's God. He can overrule anytime he wants. He can change anything he wants anytime he wants. He had a perfectly laid plan for the prophetic program, and did he change it without telling anybody? <laughs> he did. And, and he changed it in such a way that even his own apostle that he gave the entire information to did not know it was going to extend all the way into 2016. I think Paul's countenance would have dropped if he had heard that, that it was going to take that long to get people saved. And then he probably would have said, well, that means a lot of people are going to get saved. Yeah, maybe. We don't know. But I know this. He's got a set number he needs, and he's not going to stop this until he gets there. That's why you can't look at what's going on around you to think it's going to get here sooner because man's always been acting like this. So I don't know what the deal is, okay? You think you got it bad now watching TV. You've seen what they were doing in the 40s, okay? 1941, 42, 43, 44, 45. Those years were years where the world was on fire and it ended with two nuclear explosions, okay? So I can tell you that we're not there yet, but we're, we, we look like we're getting there, don't we? Every generation thinks that. And we also think that way sometimes. You know why? Because we want it to be so. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. That's what it says in the book of Revelation. Come quickly. You can pray for the rapture until you're blue in the face. It's not going to do any good. But it'll make you feel better. And I think that's good, don't you? <laughs> so you just keep asking. I mean, if you, if you let your request be made on unto God, it'll give you some peace. But notice, remember what he says about wait, patiently waiting? That's because you're the elect of God, and you're in already. You don't worry about getting in. You're in, and you can't ever get out. I want to tell you that uh, we'll talk more about the details of this next week, but I can tell you that, that faith can and will produce good works in your life. It's good for you to believe it, and it is for your obedience and service. Let's close with this passage here. It's time to stop. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It can and will produce good works. Know your election. Chapter 1. Now chapter 2, notice what he says. He says, <clears throat> he's talking about good behavior. Okay, look at verse 9. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail. 
There's that working, that laboring, that labor of love. Laboring night and day, he says, because we would not be chargeable to any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. And ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, notice, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You know, getting saved, you just believe it. If you want to live the Christian life, it's impossible, forget it, because Christianity doesn't know how to teach that. But if you want to walk in grace and walk in, in the spirit of God and do what God's will is in your life concerning your personal behavior, just read the doctrines of grace, believe them, and then apply them daily in your life, and you'll be doing that, okay? And that's all that is expected of you. You're not expected to be perfect. You're not expected to be sinless. You're not expected to do any of those things that are beyond your control. What you're expected to do, though, is to learn the things that you need to learn about who you are so that you can, when you get off track, go back and start where you're supposed to start. Every time you see a team in sports losing big time, what do they do? Get rid of the coach. <laughs> First thing they do, get rid of the coach. Again, new coach comes in. He goes, okay, guys, it's back to basics now, okay? I want to teach you how to catch the ball today. <laughs> I want to teach you how to hold the ball. I want to teach you how to run. I want to teach you how to block. I want to teach you how to shoot the ball. I want to teach you all the basics. So what I'm going to have you do is start practicing the basics. And you know they forget the basics. What happens? What happens if you run down the, if you run down the field carrying the ball like this? The guy walks up from behind. He just punches it out, and the other guy catches it and runs the other way. But if you carry it like that, it's going to be harder, right? If you don't know the basics, what happens? You lose, okay? So take the basics and put them back into action in your life. Always running back to who you are in Christ. Quit trying to get into Christ or even not so much get into Christ. If you're saved, you already know that, I hope. But at the same time, instead of going out and putting on a show and showing people who you are, who you want to be instead of who you really are, that, that, gets, that gets really tiresome. Seeing people live like that and demonstrating to you by their good works how wonderful and great they are and how good a deal God got when I got saved and all that kind of thinking, you know what happens is you begin to, your posture and your thinking begins to offend people because they really know better. And you should, too, if you act that way. The girls were talking about that this morning when Stephanie put her offering in the offering bucket, and she said, there's $2 in there now. And Naomi corrected her, and she said, you're not supposed to talk about how much you give because you're boasting. <laughs> I said, preach it, Naomi. You got it. But it's okay, Stephanie, if you want to say you put $2 in. Okay, it's fine. But you see, that, that thinking about, you know, you being the issue is not, you're not the issue. You're dead. You're gone. You're already done. You're now to function as a new person, as a new member of the body of Christ, as a new part of God's creation, that can now not only live like you're supposed to live, but you can also, I guess you might say it this way, you, you can walk the walk, okay? And, uh, and not just talk it. That's important. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word, and we thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that by the grace of God, we have eternal life now by believing and by trusting you by faith. We thank you for it. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.